before I dive in, okay, I just uh, want to throw in my two cents and how glad I am to see Ella here today. I remember prayer times, prayer gatherings where we were praying for her life to be spared, that she would be a living, breathing, walking testimony to God's faithfulness. As long as she is here, we get that. So uh, anyway, praise be to God for that. As I was preparing for this message, I recalled my first confrontation with the law. My first confrontation was probably similar to yours in that it had to do with a moving traffic violation. I was leaving church of all places. It must have been after a youth group meeting or a Sunday night worship time where we stayed late and were goofing around at church or something because it was very dark and I was headed home. So I went to leave, I pulled out, and a friend of mine pulled out right in front of me. And he, so he pulled out, went right, and turned in the first lane. I pulled out right behind him, got in the second lane, and went to pass him. Because I am a 17-year-old male at that point, and 17-year-old males don't follow. When they're driving, they lead. And so I went to pass him. Now, he was also a 17-year-old male, and he said, oh, no, you don't. And he began to move a little quicker. And I said, oh, yes, I will. And pretty soon, I probably don't have to tell you what was going on there. And we were moving very rapidly. Now, if you've had experience driving, I'm sure that there is a time where you have seen some wacko driver just speeding through traffic, maybe weaving in and out, just moving, really hauling down the street, right? And you've thought to yourself, Where's a cop when you need one, right? You've said, man, I wish there was a cop around here. Where are they when you really need one? Well, I know where they are. They are on six mile between Farmington and Merriman. (laughs) On the eastbound side. And I know that because I saw flashing lights in my rear view mirror very quickly. Now today, the speed limit on that stretch of six mile is 45. Back then it was only 40. Now if it had been 45 back then, it wouldn't have made a difference at all, (laughs) no. We would have still been in gross violation of the speed limit. And so I had my first encounter with the law. And what I remember the most, in fact, as I sit here and think about it, my heart starts to beat a little faster because I just recall the the anxiety and the nervousness. I started sweating. I felt so guilty. I felt like a criminal. And I was a criminal. I had just broken the law. I mean, the most basic definition of a criminal is somebody who breaks the law. I had broken the law. I deserved what I got. It was not an act of injustice. It was exactly what should have happened. Today we're gonna look at a confrontation where there is injustice. In fact, it's probably the grossest violation of justice in the history of mankind. I'm not here to make a moral uh, statement or a societal statement about justice and injustice. I just want you to know I deserved it. I got what I deserved. Probably I should have even gotten more. And what we're gonna see today is somebody else paying the penalty for me and for you. A gross violation of justice. Well, with that in mind, if you would turn to John chapter 18 for this sermon, which is entitled Arrested. This is the last in a series that we're calling A Plot to Kill, and we're seeing that plot come to its final stages. We've been looking at Jesus' final week here on earth, and the activities and the events that led up to Good Friday and Easter, the moment of our redemption. And today we're actually coming to the last moments of freedom that Jesus had that week. His last moments of being able to go where he wants to go and do what he wants to do in that week. Well, if you're able, I wanna ask you to please stand with me as we read God's words to us This morning from John chapter 18, I'll be reading 1 through 11. When he had finished praying, Jesus left his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. 
On the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Ju uh, Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Those are God's inspired words to us this morning. Thank you, you can be seated. What I'm hoping happens this morning is that we all leave here with a greater sense and comfort in God's sovereignty over our lives as we look at several areas of his control over the events of this evening. And I found three major areas where Jesus exercises this control and sovereignty. There may be more. If you think of some other ones, I'm always open to learning more. You can come and tell me. There's a couple of you that every time I make that offer, you avail yourselves of that offer, and that's fine. That is fine. I, I go ahead and do it. So if you think of other ways, I'd love to hear them. The first way that Jesus exercises total control is over the setting. You think of the setting, uh, you might think of a book or a play or a movie or some sort of production, and you've got to set the scene, right? You've got to give people a context for what's going to happen. And so certain things have to be made clear to us. Certain things have to happen, and they have to happen in the right order. We need to see maybe uh, the place where this is going to happen and understand the history behind what's going to happen. Maybe we have to know what time of year, what time of day. Maybe we have to know who the characters are and the relationships they have with each other. Well, Jesus has orchestrated all the events of this day and of the week itself to bring us to this particular moment. In fact, we heard a few weeks ago how Jesus kept the location for their last meal together, that Passover meal, a secret, or at least he kept it unknown to the disciples so that Judas wouldn't have a head start. That he needed to leave at a certain time so that Jesus could bring things about in just the right way. And so he kept the location secret so that it couldn't happen till after the Passover meal and after the things that we see go on in the garden. And what we get here is several chapters of teaching from Jesus, uh, a high priestly prayer. We see a lot of things in there that were necessary last minute teachings and that we benefit from because Jesus orchestrated this in the right way. What we come to understand is that he is truly offering his life as opposed to having it taken from him. I'm gonna refer to a, several verses uh, today to, to kind of help us see these things, and I'm going to stay in the book of John. There's lots of scripture we could use, a lot of things written by Paul, uh, things from the other gospels that we could go to to point out these. I'm just going to stay in John because John really wants us to see this, and I want to see how it plays out. In John chapter 10, for instance, we have this great passage at the beginning of John 10 where he talks about sheep and shepherd. I'm the shepherd, you're the sheep. And he talks about the relationship of the sheep to the shepherd and makes some uh, great, incredible points about the kind of relationship we have with him in that passage. Finally, in verse 10, uh, the second half of the verse, he gives us his purpose for actually becoming a man and living among us. He says, I have come that you might have life and that that life would be a full one, a meaningful one, a life that's worth living, a life that you would be glad 
to live, not just uh, forever in heaven in my presence, but also right now. I mean, our eternal life begins the moment we begin that relationship with God and trust in Jesus for our salvation. And so that life can begin any moment. And I have to admit, I really like the life that God has given me. And I hope you do too. I hope you think of it that way. Well, anyway, he, he uh, says that and then switches in verse 11. He says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In contrast to just the hired guy that's just there to babysit, who will run away at the first sign of danger, the good shepherd stands between the sheep and danger, offering his life if necessary. We keep going in that passage in verse 15, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. He uses a personal pronoun. I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life. Very voluntarily lay down my life. Verse 17, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. I have control. I lay it down. I take it up. Verse 18, <clears throat> excuse me. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I am giving my life. It's not being taken from me. I am offering it. We have to see that. We have to see that he has this authority. He goes on in 18 to say, I have authority to lay it down. It's well within my control. I have the say, and I'm going to do it. I am going to lay down my life and I will take it back again. God has given me that authority to do that. And we see that play out. He has full control, not the Pharisees and the Sadducees, not Pilate, not the Sanhedrin, not King Herod or any other group of people out there. Jesus is in control of his own life, when, how, and where. And so he sets the scene. He has control over all those elements that lead up to this moment. And what is this moment? The moment of his arrest, which is the second thing that uh, I want to talk about him having control over. He has control over the arrest itself. He willingly allows it. Remember, he steps forward. He goes to them. Yes, they're coming out to the garden, but he steps forward and says, who are you looking for? He's not standing back waiting. He's not just letting it happen. He's going out to make it happen. He has control over this. He has control over whether this takes place. He has control over protecting his disciples from arrest as co-conspirators. He's totally willing to accept the punishment from God and from these people. And he shows us that. John goes through and shows us multiple times how Jesus has control over his future. He writes differently than the other gospel writers. We heard that from our Pastor Brad a few weeks ago, how uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called synoptics because they write with the same view, sort of. They, they write a lot of the same stories, maybe with some different elements, but they write a lot of the same things because they're trying to make a point. Well, John writes about 30 years later, the world has changed, Jerusalem is no longer around as a hub. The, the world has just changed for believers in radical ways and he writes some different things because believers in the world at that time needed different information. Well, he, he does include a few things that are the same. One of them is the feeding of the 5,000 in John chapter six. Now, why would he keep this in there if it's told three other places? Well, he adds a very different twist at the end of it, something he wants us to know that the others haven't told us. In verse 14, the way the people respond is this. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world, a reference to him being the Messiah the chosen one. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again into the hills 
by himself. Because he had taken a little boy's lunch, five loaves and two fish, and I, I have a feeling it's two pretty small fish, and five kind of small loaves because this is a boy. We're not talking about a grown man, we're talking about a boy. He took that lunch, fed 5,000 men, plus women and children. Some people say it could have been as many as 20,000 people. It's at least 10 to 15. And there's 12 baskets left over. That's an incredibly miraculous sign. And the people's response is, let's make him king. We will make him be our king. I totally understand that. If you never had to worry about food for the rest of your life, either buying it, making it, cleaning up after, all you had to do is eat, man, that'd be a great life. I'd buy in. Well, that would have brought about what's gonna happen in chapter 18 much sooner, and he wasn't ready for it. The world wasn't ready for that. There were other things that needed to happen. And so Jesus gets away from this determined crowd of 10 to 15,000 people who are determined to make him king, and somehow he gets away from them. Then again, in chapter 10, not long after the other passage I read, Jesus is in the temple, and he's, he's uh, teaching and talking to uh, the Jews, and now they're angry with him. Instead of wanting to make him king, they want to do something else to him. And it says in verse 39, Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. Now he's in a confined area. There's walls all around. These people want him. They want to seize him, and somehow he gets away. He knows how to do this. In chapter 7, I skipped over this, but in chapter 7, he's having a conversation. talks about uh, believing in him and accepting him being like living water welling up within you. And they know this is not good. This is contrary to what they're being taught and how they want things to go. And he's stirring the crowd up. They want to seize him, and he gets away from them uh, that time as well. The fourth time John shows us in chapter 11, after he raises Lazarus from the dead, raises Lazarus from the dead, and that causes a problem for a lot of the teachers of the law and the religious people, because the people are starting to go, well, you guys don't do that. And um, they want to kill him. They're looking for him. And so they're scouring the countryside, and they're looking in cities. They're looking everywhere for him, and they cannot find him. They cannot catch up to him. Four times John shows us him being confronted by a crowd that want to seize him for something, and he gets away from them. So I ask you, in John chapter 18, when this crowd comes to the garden, could he have gotten away from them? I think history from the book of John says absolutely. It's kind of a rhetorical question at that point. Of course he could get away. He's been doing it all along. Well, let's look at the elephant in the room. Something very interesting happens here when the crowd approaches. And Jesus steps forward and says, who are you looking for? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. How does he respond? He says, I am he. And they fall down, they fall back, and they fall down. What is going on there? Well, when languages are translated, they don't always come through perfectly. You don't always get all the sense of a language when it's uh, translated from one to another, even something as simple as, uh, that's me, I am he. Because in English, you add that he at the end because of the rules of language. It's an understood he that is not in the Greek. So what Jesus is really saying when they come up and say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, is he's saying, I am. Now, if you've read the Bible, and you've heard it preached, you know there's something special about God saying, I am. That's his name. This is God saying his name, and the response of these people when God says his name is to fall back and fall down. I don't know if it's out of worship or fear or both. 
but they fall back and they fall down because you can't stand in God's presence when he's declaring his name. John loves uh, God's name and he puts it in here often in his book. In chapter six, verse 35, he tells people, I am the bread of life. In chapter eight, verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, verse seven, I am the sheep gate. Again, in chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. We saw that one. In chapter 11, he tells Martha as he's coming to raise Lazarus from the dead, I am the resurrection and the life. In chapter 14, we get that incredible passage where he tells people, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then in chapter 15, verse one, I am the true vine. It's a literary device that John uses often to lead us to this point where he steps up to the crowd and says, I am, and they can't help but fall down and tremble before him. When we first learned of his name, it was in Exodus three, when Moses said, hey, when I go tell these people we're leaving, I gotta have a name for you. I gotta be able to tell them, somebody sent me, what is your name? And God says, I am that I am. In fact, you go tell them, I am sent you. And Moses went and freed the people of Israel, his chosen people from slavery to Egypt and took them to freedom. Now we have God saying his name again and he is about to emancipate all who believe forever from slavery to sin and death and to give us freedom and life through what's about to happen. And John is deliberately showing us these things. Anyway, Jesus is in total control here, complete control, which leads us to the third thing he has control over and that is these disciples' future. In chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus is praying, and he gets to a point where he prays for his disciples and for all those who will believe because of their message. Guess who that is? That's us. That's you and me. If we have believed in Jesus, it's because of the message they preached soon after this, because they began to tell people about Jesus, and that word kept going and going and going all through the years until now when we heard the message and we've responded to it with belief and offered ourselves to Jesus as our Savior. He was praying for us. And so what he's doing here for the disciples, he's also doing for us in some way. You can see this mob showing up. In in verse eight, Jesus shows control over their fate by saying, okay, you've come for me, you're gonna let these people go. Now let me help you understand why that's important. There is a mob coming, there is a huge group. It doesn't come out so clearly in John, but if you read the other gospels in their account here, this is a huge crowd of people. This is not a dozen people coming. This is hundreds of people coming for this event. Why are there that many people and why do they have all these weapons? Well, because Jesus has a lot of followers. Soon after this, in the book of Acts, we know for sure that there's at least still 120 who are following and still believing after his death. There may have been more before his death that were hanging around, this group of people that were believing and following and supporting him. And so there's This is why there's so many coming. They're expecting resistance. They're also expecting to arrest a bunch of these other people. For sure the 12, and then probably some others who resist as well. This is the expectation. If you're a follower of Jesus, well, if you're a disciple of any teacher and that teacher is accused of heresy, guess who gets lumped in with them? Guilty by association. All the followers just kind of goes with the territory. And so they're expecting to arrest a lot of people tonight. Jesus, while he still has control over this crowd, while he's still exercising his divine authority based on saying his name, declaring his name to them, gives freedom to these other people. At least the 12, 
I guess 11 at this point, at least the 11 who are still left, and then there may have been other people around as well. But they get off and they don't, even after one of them takes out a sword and goes after somebody. Even after that, they're allowed to walk away. Jesus in total control over the future of those disciples. We have to see that. So where does that leave us? Where does that leave you and me? Well, I thought about some different ways of coming up with an explanation for Jesus' control over our lives and thought of you know, some flowery language, tried to come up with some good examples, and then I just decided to defer to something well-written from history, something that we all subscribe to. Uh, on Mondays, Pastor Brad is going through the Belgic Confession, going through the articles one by one, sometimes one in a few weeks because they can be kind of long. One of the articles is about God's providence, Article 13. It talks about God's goodness, his good oversight and care in our lives. And it says this about it, and I think this is a great way for us to see how we can count on his control, his sovereignty over our lives and over the situations in our lives. It says this, we believe that this good God, after creating all things, did not abandon them to chance or fortune. There's so many people that will say, I believe in God, but I don't believe he's intimately involved. He just wound it all up and then stepped back. That is not true. We do not believe that. He did not just leave it to chance or fortune, but leads, currently leads, actively leads, and governs them according to his holy will. God is actively involved, leading, guiding, governing the events in our lives in such a way that nothing happens in this world without God's orderly arrangement. Later in that article it says this, and this is where I really want us to uh, walk away with these words ringing in our ears. This doctrine gives us unspeakable comfort since it teaches us that nothing, not one thing, can happen to us by chance but only by the arrangement of our gracious Heavenly Father. Some of those things are not going to seem real good to us at the time. Some of those things that happen to us are going to seem like they're bad. We are going to declare those things aren't good. From our perspective, that might be true. But God's promise is that He's not going to let anything go by in your life without using it for your benefit. Okay, I'm going to leave the book of John just for this one. In Romans 8, it talks about God loving us so much that he'll use every instance in our lives, the good, the bad, the ugly, for our benefit if we love him, if we walk in the calling according to his purpose, he will make something good out of it. That's his promise. And that's reflected in this article in the Belgic Confession. Do you believe that? I have to admit, I question it sometimes, but I always come back to submitting to the Lord, submitting to his will, knowing he really does want the best for me, and he wants the best for you as well, and he's gonna make it good. Let's pray. Lord, we know that your arrest seemed like a bad thing at the moment, there are so many things that happen in our lives that don't seem good in the moment. And yet, just as you promised that all those things are gonna to work to our benefit and that you will orchestrate those things to be a benefit to us, this instance, this event worked out for our benefit. You paid the penalty for our sin. You brought us back into relationship with our God. You brought back the fellowship that we were always intended to have with our God and our Creator. Jesus, thank you for willingly going, surrendering yourself to make that happen. So we thank you in your holy name. Amen.